Last week, discussed the second of John Wesley's three rules for entrance into the Methodist societies, and that's simply do good. Wesley challenges us to do good, but Jesus commands it. Luke records Jesus as saying, but I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. In addition to obeying the love command of Jesus, we do good to others, remember from the last week, because each person is made in the image of God. And those who do good have, as Wesley said, the image of God stamped on their hearts. But today we ask the question, well, how do we do that? How do we do good? Our scripture reading for today comes to us from Romans, Romans chapter 12. We'll be looking at verses 9 through 21. So Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. And you might be interested to know that, Nicole Kay, this was the text that was read at our wedding. And you say, oh, good, good, very good. good. May we pray. Eternal God, we are thankful that you want to speak to us. So open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to what you have to say to us this day through this scripture. We ask these prayers in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In honor of God's word, I invite you to please stand. So Romans 12, verse 9. Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought of what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of God. And you say, be please be seated. In 1739, John Wesley wrote these words in his famous journal. There is scarce any possible way of doing good for which here is not daily occasion. Here are poor families to be relieved. Here are children to be educated. Here are workhouses wherein both young and old gladly receive the word of exhortation. Here are the prisons and therein a complication of human wants. When I was a child, we used to take family vacations every year. We'd always drive, we would never fly, and we would see the USA in our Chevrolet, or later our Buick Electra Deuce and a Quarter. We would drive over or down to Georgia or Florida, Remember when you go to, when we drive to, uh, to Florida, I always stop at the Welcome Center and get the orange juice, I was like that. Well, back in the 1970s, and they're also the, the 60s and earlier, they didn't have as many chain restaurants as they do today. There were no Cracker Barrels uh, back then. In order to assure 
that we would eat at a decent restaurant while we were driving out of state, my father would look for a restaurant that had an eat, E-A-T, or good eats sign in all capital letters on the roof. Do you remember those? Remember those? Drive around, the, the, the good eats uh, sign. So my father thought, well, if it has good eats, it must be good food, right? So let's go and eat there. Only problem is, is that by the late 1970s and early 1980s, those signs had disappeared, but my father kept on looking for them. In our scripture reading from Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul resembles a restaurant manager. The restaurant sign read, not good eats, but do good. Paul had already talked about the wait staff, if you will, in, uh, in the diner in verses 3 through 8 uh, that preceded what we, what we read. We readers here of Romans chapter 12 are invited to pick up a towel and put on an apron and actually get to work according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. We have gifts. Read that we have jobs. We have jobs that differ according to the grace given to us. That's from verse 6. Therefore, we have faith that has been assigned to us, grace that has been given to us. We have both the assignment to do good and the means by which to carry the assignment forward. We are expected to work as we can. But we sometimes encounter problems. Problem number one is some Christians do nothing because they think that God expects them to serve beyond their or our ability. Oh, I could never do that. Well, God is not asking us to do what we can't do. And by the way, there were others in the Bible who felt the same way. And they were astonishingly wrong uh, about their own self-assessment. Moses, Jeremiah, and John the Baptist all come to mind. Problem number two. Some think that they are not needed because the load is being carried by others. That is a group of very capable people. Well, somebody else is going to, to do that and, and doing it quite well. Therefore, I'm not needed and, and I not only don't pay, I don't even need to. Paul's view, though, of this situation is that the Holy Spirit has given us tasks just like parts of the body have jobs to do. You do the good that you've been asked and tasked to do, nothing less. In verses 7 and 8, you teach if you're a teacher, you exhort if you're an exhorter, you minister if you're a minister, you give if you're a giver, you lead if you're a leader, you act cheerfully if you are a compassionate one. In other words, you pay what you can. And the Apostle Paul is not done with this list of doing good. Paul wrote a whole set of additional ways for Christians to do good in verses 14 through 21. Here we go. Bless those who persecute you. Do not curse those who persecute you. Rejoice with those who rejoice. We don't know that one. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony. Don't be stuck up. Mingle with the less fortunate. Don't think you're so smart. Don't repay evil with evil. Live peaceably with all. Don't take revenge. Feed your hungry enemies. Give drink to the thirsty enemies. Don't be overcome with evil. Overcome evil with good. If we live such a lifestyle of doing good, then what kind of Christianity does this look like? For a church, perhaps living this kind of Christianity resembles what happened at my very first uh, church 
uh, back in the early 1990s, which was uh, Oak Grove uh, United Methodist Church and then a rural Denton County. At this church, we wanted to ramp up our missions. We knew uh, that uh, we had missionaries that were sent abroad and were doing a great job, but uh, we wanted to do something for the people in America. And therefore, we started a domestic missions fund. We sent two people to Iowa with flood relief supplies back during the, the flood of 1993. We especially wanted to do good for people locally. We learned that there was an ill man in our community in desperate need of financial straits. When the person heading up this committee overseeing that fund went over to his trailer unannounced and delivered a check for $1,000, you should have seen the look on this man's face. He was so appreciative and surprised that through his tears, he gave not us, but God the thanks. Think about this. God would not have received that praise if that church had not done good. For an individual, Perhaps living this kind of Christianity resembles what happened in 2009 at an IHOP in downtown Wichita Falls. One of our church's members was eating there when this person noticed what looked like army soldiers. It looked like they were enjoying their root and tooty fresh and fruity pancakes or some similar type of breakfast. And then this church member recognized one of the men as one of the soldiers from Fort Hood who drove uh, from Killeen all the way up to Wichita Falls in order to present the American flag minutes earlier at a graveside uh, service for one of our members, Ron Ellerick, who was a veteran. By the way, Ron had been a drummer of the 1960s rock group, Paul Revere and the Raiders. In appreciation for this soldier's service to his country and for participating in Ron Ellerick's service, this church member asked the waitress for the tables check. The soldiers probably did not know the identity of their benefactor but they knew that good had been done to them. For other individuals, perhaps a lifestyle of doing good uh, resembles a summer period of leave taken by the Reverend Betty Meadows, a general presbyter of the, the Mid-Kentucky Presbytery, um, position something vaguely similar to our uh, bishops. Reverend Meadows describes a summer sabbatical that transformed her life. She left the churchy world behind and went undercover, like that TV show Undercover Boss, uh, for three months by working at a waffle house as a hostess. To her surprise, as she put it, Christ showed up every day. A van broke down in the parking lot on the 4th of July. The van was carrying a, a family from Alabama. No garage or mechanic could be found on the 4th of July. A waitress heard of their plight and called her boyfriend, who arrived 15 minutes later and fixed their van for the price of a cup of coffee. Christ was there, working through the mechanic and the waitress. A lawyer set up shop in the Waffle House. This lawyer offered legal help to the needy in the community for what they could pay, or no payment at all if they couldn't afford it. Day after day, this lawyer sat at a table smoking his cigar, it was the Waffle House, 
uh, meeting client after client and turning down no one. Christ was there working through that lawyer. A woman hobbled into the restaurant, a cast on one leg, but displaying signs of other medical difficulties. The police had just arrested her boyfriend for drunken driving and had impounded his truck. He, she, this woman, was turned out on the streets with no place to go. The restaurant was so busy that none of the staff could give her a ride to the bus station. But this woman called her landlord, who lived 90 minutes away. He dropped everything and drove right over to pick her up. When the landlord arrived, Reverend Meadows said to him, Well, how kind of you to drive so far for one of your tenants, this woman. And the man looked puzzled at, about all of this, and he said, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I? Christ was there working through the landlord. When we do good, people see Christ in us. But we also need to say that Christ is working through us. Um, and that he is the one who is inspiring us to help others. Therefore, think about how you might practice this second rule of doing good. And when you do good in the name of Jesus, the love command of Jesus, you bring praises to God. Both my mother and my grandmother Kay introduced me to poetry. My mother had to learn a hundred lines of poetry a week in high school. A hundred lines. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote one of my favorite poems. Listen, my children, you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day in the year of the... Oh, y'all are great. Yes, the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Well, John Wesley remembered that famous year, 1775. The three simple rules, including today's rule of doing good, were his rules for entering his societies. In that year, 1775, Wesley introduced a covenant service as an important part of the spiritual life in Methodist societies. This renewal service was a time for Methodists to gather annually in a time of self-examination, reflection, and dedication. He wanted Methodists to wholly, the W, wholly offer themselves and renew their covenant with God. Repentance through confession and commitment was a key focus of the service, which demanded humility from those willing to submit themselves to the dynamic words that are listed, included in this liturgy. According to John Wesley's journal, the Covenant Renewal Service was held on various occasions throughout the year. The Covenant Renewal Service is a practice that continues in churches and in other Christian communities today. On May the 1st of this year, Reverend Keith Boyette sent Tyler Street a letter. He serves or has served as the transitional connectional officer of the Global Methodist Church. He wrote to us, on Thursday, April the 27th, 2023, the Transitional Leadership Council approved your request and your church is now a member congregation of the Global Methodist Church, effective Sunday, April the 30th of 2023. 
He goes on to say, I encourage you to use Wesley's covenant renewal service as a means of both celebrating your new relationship as a member congregation of the Global Methodist Church and renewing your covenant with God. So on this first Sunday after Labor Day, a week when we are kicking off our fall activities, we are observing Covenant Renewal Sunday. And so I invite you to uh, locate inside your bulletin the uh, insert, the longer insert, the one that says uh, Wesley's Covenant Renewal Service for today. Dearly loved brothers and sisters, the Christian life is a life found in Christ, redeemed from sin, and consecrated to God. We are those who have entered into this life and have been admitted into the new covenant of Jesus Christ. He is the mediator of this covenant. He sealed it with his own blood so it would last forever. On one side of this covenant stands God, who promises to give us new life in Jesus Christ the author and perfecter of our faith. Every day, God proves his goodness and grace to us, showing us that his promise still stands firm. On the other side, we stand as those who promise to no longer live life for ourselves, but instead to only live life, live for Jesus Christ, because he has loved us and given his life for us. There are times in our lives uh, when it is important for us to remember and reaffirm our promises and our vows. In this same way, we come today to renew our covenant with God. Many generations have done this before. Today, we make our covenant with God. We make the covenant our own, renewing with both joy and sincerity the covenant that binds us all to God. So we are those who seek to live as true disciples of Jesus Christ. But sometimes we fall short. Let us now examine ourselves before God by humbly confessing our sins and submitting our hearts so that we do not deceive ourselves and cut ourselves away from God. Let us pray. Father God, you have set forth the way of life through your Son, Jesus Christ whom you love dearly. We shamefully confess that we have been slow to learn of him and have been reluctant to follow him. You have spoken and called to us, but we have not listened. You have revealed your beauty to us, but we have been blind. You have stretched out your hands to us through friends, but we have passed them by. We accepted your gifts and offered little thanks. We are unworthy of your unchanging love. We now confess to you our sins. Please forgive us for the poverty of our worship, for the selfishness of our prayers, for our inconsistency and unbelief, for the ways we neglect fellowship and your grace, for our hesitation to tell others about Christ, and for the ways we deceive ourselves. Forgive us for when we waste time and when we misuse the gifts you have given to us. Forgive us for when we have made excuses for the wrong things we have done and when we have purposefully avoided responsibility. Forgive us that we have been unwilling to overcome evil with good and that we have not been ready to carry your cross. Forgive us that we have not allowed your love to work through us to help others and that we have not made their suffering our own. Forgive us for those times when, we in, when instead of working for unity, we have made it hard for others to live with us because of our lack of forgiveness, inconsiderate judgment, and quick criticism. Forgive us for when we have not tried to reconcile with others and when we have been slow to seek redemption. Forgive us also for these sins that we, quiet, or that we silently confess to you now. God, the Father of all mercies, is faithful to cleanse us from our sins and restore us to Christ's image, 
Praise and glory be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Number six is the invitation. Let us gather here before God now in covenant, commit ourselves to Christ as his servants. Let us give ourselves to him so that we may fully belong to him. Jesus Christ has left us with many services to be done. Some of these services are easy and honorable, but some are difficult and disgraceful. Some line up with our desires and interests, others are contrary to both. In some, we please both Christ and ourselves, but then there are other works where we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Jesus Christ, we offer you this prayer. Let me be your servant. Let me follow your commandments. I will no longer follow my own desires. I give myself completely to your will. The power and strength to live as true servants is given to us in Christ. We accept the place and work that he gives us by acknowledging that he alone will be our reward. I am not my own. I am yours alone. Make me into what you will. Rank me with those you will. Put me to use for you. Put me to suffering for you. Let me be employed for you. Let me be laid aside for you. Let me be lifted high for you. Let me brought low for you. Let me be full or let me be empty. Let me have all things or let me have nothing. With a willing heart, I freely give everything to your pleasure and disposal. Christ is Savior to those who are his true servants. He is the source of all salvation to those who obey. To be his servant is to consent fully to his will. Christ accepts nothing less. Christ will be all in all, he'll be nothing. Now confirm this truth in holy covenant. Make it a reality in your life in these three ways, these three or four ways. First, set apart time in your day, more than once, to be spent alone with the Lord. Seek to perceive God's special care for you and gracious acceptance of you. Carefully think through the words of this covenant and its conditions. Examine your heart, even if you have freely given your life to Christ. Name the sins in your life. Reflect on whether you are willing to choose Christ's holy laws and strict commands. Be sure you are clear in all of these so that you do not lie to God. Second, Uphold a serious spirit of holy awe and reverence. Third, claim God's covenant. Do not trust in your own strength and power, but rely upon God's promise of giving grace and strength. In this way, he will empower you to keep your promise. Fourth, be determined to be faithful. You have given your heart and life to God. You have opened your mouth to dedicate yourself to the Lord. With God's power, never go back to your former way of living. And last, be prepared to renew your covenant with God. Fall on your knees, lift your hands, open your hearts. In our covenant prayer number seven, let us pray together. My righteous God, for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, see me now as I fall down before you. Forgive my unfaithfulness when I have not done your will. You promise mercy if I turn to you with my whole heart. God requires that you rid yourself of every idol in your life. From the bottom of my heart, I hear and now renounce every idol in my life by covenanting with you that I will not commit any known sin. By turning against your will, I have turned my love toward the world. In your power, I will watch for any temptation that will lead me away from you. Through Jesus Christ, God offers to be your God again, if you allow him to be. Before all heaven and earth, I hear and now acknowledge you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as my Lord and God. I vow to give all of myself, body and soul, to be your servant and to serve you in holiness all the days of my life. 
Jesus Christ is the only way and means to God. God has given us Jesus as the way and means of salvation. Jesus, I here and now accept you as the only new and living way. I join myself in covenant with you. I come to you as one who is hungry, sinful, miserable, blind, and naked. I am unworthy even to wash the feet of your servants. With all my power, I accept you as my Lord and head. I renounce my own unworthiness and vow that you are the Lord, my righteousness. I renounce my own wisdom and take you for my only guide. I renounce my own will and take your will as my law. Christ has told you that you must suffer with him. Jesus, I here and now make this covenant with you and accept whatever comes in life. Through your grace, I promise that neither life nor death will separate me from you. God has given holy laws as the rule of your life. I here and now willfully take on your yoke and burden. All your laws are holy, just, and good. I accept them as the rule for my words, thoughts, and actions. And I promise I will strive to order my whole life around your direction. I will not allow myself to neglect anything I know to be my duty. Almighty God searches and knows you, even the thoughts of your heart. O oh God, you know we have made this covenant today in sincerity, without deceit or reluctance. If you find anything false in us, guide us and help us to set it right. And now glory be to you, God the Father. From this day forward, I shall look upon you as my God and Father. Glory be to you, God the Son. You have loved me and washed me from my sins in your own blood. From this day forward, I shall look upon you as my Savior and Redeemer. Glory be to you, O God the Holy Spirit. By your almighty power, you have turned my heart from sin to God. From this day forward, I shall look upon you as my comforter and guide. O oh, my Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have now become my covenant friend, and I, through your infinite grace, have become your covenant servant. You are mine, and I am yours. So be it. May this covenant that I made here on earth be ratified in heaven. Amen. Turn in your bulletin. Uh, bulletin itself, and there you'll see our dismissal with blessing. This comes from this covenant renewal service. May our God, who establishes covenant relationship with those who seek to enter the kingdom, be with you always. May Jesus Christ, who seals the new covenant with his blood on the cross, bring you peace. May the Holy Spirit guide your life both now and forever. Go in peace to serve the Lord. And you say, Amen.